Hey everybody, so today we're going to be going over chapter 8, Pathophysiology. Doop. So in this chapter we're going to be going over uh, cellular metabolism as well as the components needed for adequate perfusion throughout our body. So during this lesson you'll learn about processes that occur within, our, within the human body and how they become disrupted or deranged. One of the most fundamental purposes of emergency care is being able to maintain adequate perfusion of the body cells to ensure continuous delivery of oxygen and glucose and removal of wasteful byproducts. These basic molecules, oxygen and glucose, are necessary for normal cell metabolism and function within our body. So when we become injured or we become ill, this can pos potentially disturb this uh, perfusion and allow for wasteful byproducts to build within our body and our body becoming be get moving into an acidotic state. Cellular metabolism, also known as cellular respiration, is the process in which the body cells break down molecules of glucose to produce energy for the body. There are two types of cellular metabolism, aerobic and anaerobic metabolism. Aerobic metabolism being the one where oxygen takes place, or where, excuse me, aerobic metabolism is metabolism in which oxygen is available and present during the meta, meta getting tongue tied here, oxygen is present during the metabolic state of the cell, whereas when there is a lack of oxygen, that it is called anaerobic metabolism, catch the A. Alright, if you look, think back to your terminology, A means without. Aerobic metabolism is a breakdown of molecules such as glucose through a series of reactions that produce energy within the cells in the presence of oxygen. Okay, now during the initial steps of this metabolism, it doesn't require a large amount of oxygen, if any at all, and produces only small amounts of energy. So it does start through in anaerobic metabolism before the oxygen is then presented. Once it goes through the metabolic process, oxygen is then entered to assist in the process of extracting the energy from glucose and eventually removing any wasteful product any waste that was produced during the process. So as you can see in this picture you have aerobic metabolism, okay. Glucose enters the cell, energy is beginning and it's beginning to be broken down. Oxygen then enters the cell, allows a large amount of ATP or energy to exit the, then exit the cell, and all of the wasteful byproducts is then removed from the cell back into circulation to eventually be be uh, extracted through the body. Cells must engage in metabolism to produce the energy needed by the cell to carry out its functions. When there's an adequate amount of oxygen available to the cell, it produces that greater amount of energy and the body is able to convert waste products to forms that the body that can then eliminate in a safe manner. So the initial steps of metabolism takes place in the cytosol and it's called glycolysis. So during that glycolysis phase it's producing a small amount of ATP and as it continues throughout th through the mitochondria of the cell this is where that larger amount of ATP is then produced for the body to be able to function. Other byproducts of aerobic metabolism include heat, carbon dioxide, and water. The heat produced is used to maintain a normal body core temperature. As you would expect, an increased metabolism results in increased body core temperature. The carbon dioxide produced by metabolism is then transported in the blood and blown off in exhalation during the exhalation phase of normal respiration. An increase in metabolism results in an increase in the respiratory rate to eliminate the extra carbon dioxide. The water produced by metabolism is then reabsorbed and used within the body or is excreted. Thus, all of the products of aerobic metabolism are either used by the body 
or eliminated without causing any harm to the cells or to the patient. And a high amount of energy is then made available to allow for normal body functions. With the majority of the ATP that is created used within the sodium potassium pump. Sodium is primarily found outside of our cell, outside of the cell, and potassium found primarily inside of a cell. Without a functioning sodium potassium pump, sodium that finds its way into the cell cannot exit and accumulates inside the cell. The sodium potassium pump energy is required to pump sodium molecules out of the cell against the concentration gradient. Potassium then moves with the gradient to flow into the cell. Sodium and potassium are exchanged in a continuous cycle that is necessary for proper cell function. The cycle continues as long as the cells produce energy through aerobic metabolism. When insufficient energy is produced through anaerobic metabolism, the sodium potassium pump will fail and cells will die. When the concentration of sodium in the cell is too high, potassium then cannot enter and the cell cannot function. Excess sodium in the cell causes, allows excess water to enter the cell. Excess water then causes the cell to swell, rupture, and eventually die. <coughs> Anaerobic metabolism is the breakdown of molecules in the cells without the presence of oxygen. The term anaerobic means without oxygen. Just as with aerobic metabolism, glucose crosses the cell membrane and normal glycolysis occurs with the production of pyruvic acid and the release of a small amount of ATP. Without the avail availability of oxygen, however, the pyruvic acid is not able to enter the next phase of metabolism and is then converted to lactic acid. So the byproducts of anaerobic metabolism are lactic acid with a small amount of ATP. So when you're working out and you start feeling that burn in your extremities, you start feeling the burn in your ankles or in your knees, your body is actually going through a, through a state of anaerobic metabolism. You actually have lactic a or pyruvic acid beginning to form within your extremities, which then eventually could potentially lead to lactic acid. And that is because you're of you working out, it is causing an increase in metabolism and not enough metabolism or not enough oxygen for the metabolism needed. During anaerobic metabolism, because of the amount of energy produced and the lactic acid that is beginning to result, the sodium potassium pump actually begins to fail. So thus causing the cells to swell rupture and um, die. If the acid accumulates, it produces an acidic environment that may actually disrupt its function and stability. High acid levels inactivate enzyme functions, disrupt cell membranes, and ultimately lead to cell death. In addition, the cell has little energy to perform its normal functions. So if you have cardiac cells that are going through this process, what do you think is going to happen? You start having cell damage within the heart, thus causing you to go into heart failure potentially and have a heart attack or go into cardiac arrest. Perfusion can be described as the delivery of oxygen, glucose, and other substances to the cells and the elimination of these wasteful products from the cells. To maintain an adequate perfusion, the components of the delivery and removal system must work properly. And it requires in, uh, multiple components in order to be able to interact appropriately such as the composition of ambient air. How much, why do we, would you think that's important? 
Well, we have to breathe, right? Oxygen is part of is needed for life. It is needed for um, ATP to be able to work functionally. So the composition of the air that we breathe would be of importance. How many of you all know exactly how much air is contained with it, or how much oxygen is contained is contained within the air that we breathe right now as you, where you sit? Right, 21%. So if you go somewhere um, such as Denver, how much air is there? It's more around about 16, 17%. So you th to some people it's like, oh, well, you know, that's not much of a difference. But you're only you and you only use four or five percent of that air. But what if you become hyperventilated? You're not used to it, so you be, it's when you go to breathe it in. You that's when you start becoming lightheaded because you don't have enough air when you breathe in. The patency of the airway matters as well. Being able to breathe adequately and being able to ventilate and get good breath, good breaths in. Transport of O2 and CO2 by the blood, being able to circulate blood throughout the body to be able to carry oxygen and carbon dioxide. Um, having proper blood volume and not being dehydrated or hypovolemic. The heart itself being able to function properly and be able to pump blood throughout the body. Uh, blood pressure and uh, systemic vascular resistance and being able to perfuse all organs of the body. We'll cover this more in detail when we get to our cardiovascular chapters. Any alteration within any component that was just previously listed could potentially lead to cellular, perfu perfu cellular perfusion being poorly affected. So when this happens, when perfusion is then affected by these components altered, it causes the shells to shift from a state of aerobic metabolism to anaerobic metabolism. So our care for these patients is trying to restore and maintain any of the components that are um, altered. If our patient's not breathing adequately, we ventilate for them. If they're not getting enough oxygen, if the ambient air has become affected, we give provide them oxygen with via non breather or bag valve, bag valve mask. If they are if they have an issue with the pump, we do chest compressions to circulate that blood. Because if you have cell death, cell death then leads to tissue death, which then leads to organ death, which then leads to organ system failure, which then leads to organism death. Um, within the ambient air, as I said earlier, 21% of the air that we breathe is con is oxygen. Um, with that being said, there's multi as more gases within our air, such as nitrogen being a large component of the ambient air that we breathe in. <coughs> Excuse me. Seven, approximately 78% of the air that of the ambient air at sea level is of nitrogen, 21% being oxygen, 0.9% uh, being argon, 0.03 being carbon dioxide, and trace, very small trace amounts of gases from there. Increasing the concentration of oxygen in breath and breathed air increases the number of oxygen molecules in the alveoli, the blood, and the cells. Thus, one way to improve cellular oxygenation is by increasing the concentration of oxygen in the air breathed in by the patient. A patient breathing ambient air that contains 21% oxygen would have an FiO2 or a fraction of inspired oxygen of 0.21 or 21%. A non-rebreather mask can deliver an FiO2 of approximately 0.95, which is an oxygen concentration of approximately 95%. An FiO2 of 1 would be equal to inspiration of 100% oxygen. An FdO2, or fraction of delivered oxygen, is the difference between an FiO2 
and an FiO2, excuse me, I'm getting the difference between an FiO2 and an FDO2 is that the FiO2 is administered to a patient who is breathing spontaneously and inhaling the air on his own effort, whereas the FDO2 is delivered by a ventilation device to a patient who is not able to breathe adequately on his own. Some toxic gases displace the amount of oxygen in the air, which suffocates the patient. Carbon monoxide, for example, disrupts the ability of the blood to carry oxygen to the cells because carbon monoxide has a greater affinity to bind to red blood cells than oxygen. Cyanide interferes with oxygen use by the cell, and either of these situations would lead to hypoxia within the patient. One of the most basic and important aspects of any emergency care provided is to establish and maintain a patent airway. A patent airway is one that is open and not obstructed by blood, secretions, vomit, tissue, bone, teeth, or any other substance. Establishing an open airway is typically one of the first steps in emergency care. In some cases, it may be the only care necessary to treat the patient in the pre-hospital setting. Failure to recognize, establish, or maintain a patent airway, as already noted, could then lead to reduced oxygen concentration breathed, cellular hypoxia, and invasion eventual patient death. There are many places where an obstruction could potentially be located at. An obstruction may occur to the nasopharynx or the portion of the airway from the nostrils to the soft palate by blood, secretions, vomit, tissue swelling, bone fragments, or other substances. This usually does not pose a major airway problem if the oropharynx remains cleared. The oropharynx, or portion of the airway from the mouth and soft palate to the epiglottis, can be obstructed by the tongue, foreign bodies, tissue swelling, hematomas, blood, vomit, and other substances. Any obstruction in the oropharynx must be removed immediately. The epiglottis is a flap of cartilaginous tissue that covers the opening of the larynx during swallowing. If the epiglottis is injured and swells or becomes inflamed from infection, it can occlude the airway at the level of the larynx. The larynx can be obstructed by laryngeal spasm, also called laryngospasm, where the vocal cords spasm and close together which prevents any air from passing through into the trachea. This may result from injury, insertion of mechanical airways, or administration of some medications. A fracture to the larynx may cause the laryngeal structures to lose stability and be drawn inward, creating an obstruction. Obstruction of the trachea and bronchi by secretions, blood, vomitus, food particles, objects, tissue, swelling, bone, or other substances blocks airflow to the bronchioles, which supply the alveoli, the air sacs of the lungs, with oxygenated air. Ventilation is a mechanical process that relies on changes in pressure inside the thorax to move air in and out of the lungs. The alterations in pressure occur because of changes to the size of the thorax. Ventilation conforms to Boyle's law, which states that the volume of gas is inversely proportionate to the pressure. It can be quickly summarized as follows. An increase in pressure, or more positive, will decrease the volume of gas, whereas a decrease in pressure, or more negative, will increase the volume of gas. So when you take a breath, your thoracic cavity opens up, your diaphragm opens up, thus creating that negative pressure to allow air to come in. And when you're ready to exhale, everything contracts, causing an increase in pressure, thus causing air to exit the lungs and to be exhaled. As the parietal pleural lining is pulled upward and outward with the expansion of the chest wall, 
The serous fluid between the two linings also pulls the visceral lining upward and outward. This pulling by the serous fluid between the pleural linings is sometimes called a water glass effect. The water glass effect is similar to the surface tension created by moisture between the bottom of a glass and the surface the glass is sitting on, which tends to lift the surface when the glass is lifted. The visceral lining is attached to the outer surface of the lung. Therefore, when the visceral lining is pulled outward, the lung is forced to expand. The natural tendency of the lung, however, is to recoil and collapse because of the elasticity of this tissue. This causes the lung to constantly pull inward as the, th in as the thoracic cage is pulling it outward. This opposite pull creates a constant negative pressure or a vacuum in the pleural space or the space between the pleura. Use of accessory muscles, in addition to the diaphragm and intercostal muscles that are normally used for inhalation, may be required either to help increase the chest size to draw more air into the chest and lungs, or to help decrease the chest size to force air out of the lungs and chest. Excuse me. Contracting the accessory muscles uses more energy than normal. Keep in mind that adequate amounts of oxygen must be constantly delivered to the cells to produce energy. A patient who needs to use accessory muscles to inhale may already be experiencing a lack of oxygen delivery and energy production. If the patient lacks the energy needed to contract both regular and accessory muscles of inhalation, the respiratory muscles will begin to fail. This will then result in inadequate ventilation which will compound the patient's problems with a further decrease in oxygen delivery to cells. Table 8-2 in your book goes over various accessory muscles that are used to increase the size of the thoracic cavity and generate that greater negative pressure, thus causing an increase in flow of air into the lungs, such as the sternoclastoid, sternocleidomastoid muscles. These help lift the sternum upward. Uh, the pecto pectoralis minor helps elevate is the muscles that elevate ribs 3 to 5. The abdominal muscles, which contract to increase the pressure inside the abdominal cavity, thus causing the diaphragm to move higher against the lungs to force air out. Compliance is a measure of the ability of the chest wall and lungs to stretch, distend, and expand. A condition that causes the lungs or chest wall to become stiff would decrease compliance. A decrease in compliance makes it more difficult for the patient to move air in and out of the lungs. This also makes it more difficult for you to ventilate the patient artificially. Airway resistance is related to the ease of airflow down the conduit of airway structures leading to the alveoli. A higher airway resistance makes it more difficult to move air through the conducting airways. A lower airway resistance makes it easier to move air. Higher airway resistance, such as a blockage somewhere within the, within the uh, respiratory system, requires the patient to work harder to breathe, expending more energy and possibly using accessory muscles, which may accelerate respiratory muscle fatigue and failure. The most common cause of increased airway resistance is edema or swelling within the airway structure. Mucus and constriction of the bronchioles will also decrease the radius of the airway and increase resistance. The potential space between the pleura maintains a negative pressure. If a break occurs in the continuity of either the parietal pleura from an open wound to the thorax or to the visceral pleura from an injury to the lung tissue, the negative pressure draws air into the pleural space. With each inhalation, the thorax increases in its size and the pleural space pleural pressure becomes more negative. This draws even more air into the pleural space, increasing its volume and collapsing the lung. Lung collapse severely interferes with the ability of the alveoli to fill with air and to create an interface with the pulmonary capillaries, which then reduces gas exchange with the blood and leads to hypoxia. Therefore, occluding any open wound to the chest is done early in the primary assessment of a patient, as you will learn later.
All right, guys, we're going to take a break here. Um, stretch your legs, use the restroom if you need to, get something to drink. Um, when we come back, we will pick up with Minute Ventilation. <laughs> 